All right, welcome to episode four from this series on evolution. And in this episode, we're going to look at how does natural selection affect polygenic traits, all right? Now, you want to recall from polygenic traits is that you're going to have a normal distribution of phenotypes. So think of the bell curve where you have some extremes over here. So like we'll say this end is where giraffes have really long necks. Over here are short neck giraffes. And then these are the ones who have just the average giraffe neck size. Okay. Now natural selection is going to affect changes in this curve in three different ways. It's going to do that through directional selection, stabilizing selection, and disruptive selection. Okay, I'm going to zoom in over here on this picture. And this one here is directional selection. What happens in directional selection is the curve is going to move in one direction. So this extreme here on the left, which in this case, these are fictional creatures called snuzzles. Uh, the lighter colored snuzzles have an advantage, so over time, more and more of the snuzzles are going to be a lighter color. Okay, over here is called stabilizing selection. In this situation, the extreme phenotypes, for example, the dark snuzzles and the light colored snuzzles, they have a lower fitness. So what's going to happen here is more and more of this average color is going to be more common. So when we have natural selection, the curve is going to narrow. And then over here we have the, um, the rare one called disruptive or diversifying selection. In this case, both of the extremes have the higher fitness. So dark snuzzles and light snuzzles have a higher fitness rate. The average color snuzzle does not. And this will give you the curve with two humps. All right, so let's look at these all in a little bit more detail. All right, directional selection, once again, one end of the curve, in other words, one of the extremes has a higher fitness. This means the other extreme has selective pressures against it. In other words, it's going to be harder for those individuals to survive and reproduce. Remember your definition of fitness. Now, what happens in directional uh, selection is the curve is going to move in one direction. So here we go. We got a picture. Okay, now here we're looking at Darwin's beaks, and, or I'm sorry, Darwin finches and its beaks. And he, this dashed line right here is the original uh, curve where we had really small beaks, we had big beaks, and we have our average size beak. Well, in this situation, maybe there's some type of habitat change. Maybe we don't have medium-sized seeds anymore. Now we're all having the larger size seeds. So what happens is the curve moves to the right because these individuals right here who were the larger beak size in the original population had a higher fitness. So the birds with the larger beaks were able to survive and reproduce and pass on the large beak gene to the next generation. And that allows after generation after generation, the average size of the beak to change. So in this case, it's evolving towards a larger beak. In other words, the larger beak gene is becoming a higher frequency. It has an increase in fitness. In stabilizing selection, the individuals in the average or the center of the curve have the higher fitness. And what this is, is that you have selective pressures against both extremes. And we see this in human uh, birth weight. Okay, so over here we got this little baby. And in humans, the average size baby has the higher fitness. Okay, so down here, we have small babies. They have a low birth weight. They have a hard time surviving after birth if they're born too tiny. And then over here, we have big babies. And these guys are just, they're kind of too big to be born without complications to both them and the mother. Now, in the last 100 years, the cesarean delivery method has become much more common, so these large birth babies uh, have a tendency to survive because they're not being delivered vaginally. We can just, you know, pull them out through a, a cut in the abdomen. So over time, however, the average birth weight of a human being stays within a range of six to eight pounds. Below six, you have a hard time surviving, and above eight pounds, you know, that baby may be too big to be born.
All right. All right. So that's how stabilizing selection occurs. The extremes do not have fitness. All right. Disruptive uh, selection. This one doesn't happen as much in nature as you would think, but it can occur. In this case, both extreme phenotypes have the advantage. So over here, we have another of Darwin's uh, birds, Darwin's finches. <clears throat> and in this case, this average size beak, it doesn't have the competitive advantage. So let's say the habitat is changing where we have smaller seeds and larger seeds. The average size seed is just not out there in the habitat. So if you're a small beak bird, you have an advantage. And if you're a large beak bird, you have an advantage. Well, what happens with these medium birds is they can't get to these seeds as well as the tiny beak birds, so they don't get enough food, and their beaks are not strong enough to eat the large seeds, so therefore they can't get enough food from that end of the spectrum because they get outcompeted by the large beak birds, and therefore they're not as healthy, they can't find enough mates, they cannot produce enough offspring, so they have lower fitness, okay? So let's do a, re a review in directional selection. The curve's going to move in one direction because one of the extreme phenotypes has the advantage. In stabilizing selection, the curve is going to narrow because the average phenotype has the highest fitness and both extremes have low fitness. And in disruptive selection, you're going to get the two humps because the average has low fitness and the extremes have high fitness. Okay? Uh, these only come into play when you have a polygenic trait where you have that full range of phenotypes. So, until our next episode, we're going to catch you on the flip side.